All right, good evening. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, my name is Philip Munoz. I direct the Constitutional Studies Program uh, that's sponsoring tonight's event, and I'm just thrilled. Uh, so we're ending the year just as we uh, began it with a discussion of free speech, and uh, we, can't have, uh, we couldn't ask for a better person to do that with uh, than our guest tonight. Uh, let me start with some thank yous. As uh, pretty much everyone here in the room knows, uh, I'm just the face of the program. Jen Smith, who's working still as we go, runs the whole thing. So this is our last event of the year, and we have taxed her incredibly. So thank you, Jen, for all that you do, uh, for making everything uh, possible. Uh, I want to thank our student fellows, too. A number of you uh, are here. So the Tocqueville program, as I think most of you know, has student fellows. Uh, we just came from a 90-minute vigorous seminar with Professor Strassen, uh, which was great. I, I hated to end it. So um, thank you to the fellows for giving us your your time all year, but especially tonight uh, at the end of the, end of the semester. Um, I also want to uh, just mention, since this is our last event of the year, thank you to our benefactors. Um, none of this is possible without uh, the generous support of uh, Notre Dame alumni and friends uh, who have given so uh, generously. So thank you to our benefactors for allowing these discussions to take place uh, at Notre Dame. Uh, tonight's event is titled Hate, why we should resist it with free speech, not censorship. Um, and as I said, we have a wonderful guest uh, to, to speak on the subject, which again, thanks to Middlebury College, is in the news uh, uh, right now. Uh, we have a tradition at the program, which is we invite uh, students to introduce our speakers. So I'm going to invite uh, uh, Jeff Murphy. Jeff is a senior, off to law school uh, in the fall. He's been involved with the College Republicans and PRISM uh, in their leadership. Well, uh, well, here at uh, Notre Dame, and he will uh, introduce Professor Strassen. So, Jeff. Nadine Strassen, the John Marshall Harlan II Professor of Law at New York Law School, is a leading expert in constitutional law and human rights. She is the immediate past president of the American Civil Liberties Union, serving from 1991 to 2008 where she was not only the first woman to serve in that position, but also the youngest. She now serves on the advisory boards of EPIC, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, and the Heterodox Academy. When Strausen steps down as ACLU president, not one, not two, but three ideologically diverse sitting Supreme Court justices participated in her farewell tribute luncheon, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Antonin Scalia, and David Souter. The National Law Journal has named Strausen one of America's 100 most influential lawyers, and several other publications have named her one of the country's most influential women. Her many honorary degrees and awards include the American Bar Association's prestigious Margaret Brent Women Lawyers of Achievement Award, bestowed in 2017. Strausen has made thousands of public presentations before diverse audiences around the world, including on more than 500 campuses. A frequent media commentator, she has published widely in both academic and general interest publications. Her 2018 book, Hate, Why We Should Resist It With Free Speech, Not Censorship, has earned praise from ideologically diverse experts, including progressive Harvard University professor Cornell West and conservative Princeton University professor Robert George. Hate was selected by Washington University in St. Louis as its 2019 common read book for all incoming students. Her earlier book, Defending Pornography, Free Speech, Sex, and the Fight for Women's Rights, was named a New York Times notable book of 1995. Professor Strausen recently said in an interview that she gives a presentation almost every single day, Yet, despite this very busy schedule, she made time to be, with us, be here with us tonight, and we are grateful for it. So please join me in giving an Irish welcome to Professor Nadine Strassen. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Well, thank you so much for that very gracious introduction, Jeff, and thanks for the warm welcome. I uh, looked at your website before I came here, and I was just uh, so happy to see the mission statement of Notre Dame. I, I, no Notre Dame, you say it this here, right? Uh, I assume that uh, you all know it by heart, but let me have the pleasure of reading aloud that as a Catholic university, one of its distinctive goals is to provide a forum where, through free inquiry and open discussion, the various lines of Catholic thought may intersect with all the forms of knowledge 
found in the arts, sciences, professions, and every other area of human scholarship and creativity. I mean, I'm so inspired when I read that, and it is such a wonderful antidote to the attacks on free speech that are occurring on so many campuses. And it's kind of ironic because I suspect that many people would have a stereotype that at a Catholic university there is less free speech and free thought and open discourse. Uh, and yet you certainly exceed, at least in terms of your mission statement, what we are seeing at too many secular universities around the country. There was reference that was made to uh, Middlebury. I'm not sure if everybody recognizes what has recently happened there, that even though students who were dissenting from some of the views of the invited speaker said that they were absolutely committed to non-disruption, to not asking for disinvitation. The administration, the university president at the last minute, uh, just said that in a college, I guess, college, not a university, uh, the college president said because of supposed security concerns, uh, the speaker would be canceled. And I think that was really doubly unfair to the students because it created the implication that it was the student protesters that were causing the problem, whereas they were absolutely committed to free speech going forward. And I felt so strongly about this. I submitted a letter to the editor of the student newspaper, which I was thrilled is going to be published on Thursday. Uh, and speaking of student newspapers, I want to, I've, I've heard from uh, Jeff, who's been such a wonderful person to deal with, that uh, among the other um, exemplars of free speech on this campus. You have a wonderful student newspaper. I confess I haven't read it yet, but based on his recommendation, I'm definitely going to do that. And I want to thank not only Jeff and the de Tocqueville program, um, especially um, uh, Philip, whom I had the pleasure of meeting on Constitution Day, which as you all know, right, is September 17th. Um, the Department of Justice decided to honor Constitution Day by having a forum on campus, campus free speech, and they asked me to uh, give the keynote lecture. And by the way, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but um, because I am, after all these years, a bleeding heart liberal, um, there was a little bit of concern about whether I would accept an invitation from a Justice Department that was then headed by Jeff Sessions in the administration of Donald Trump. And I had absolutely no hesitation in doing so, even though I was told that a lot of other liberals had refused. I extremely strongly believe that um, all of us should use every opportunity to preach, not just to the choir, and to make common cause wherever we can with whomever we can on issues where we agree, as I agreed with the uh, Justice Department's focus on free speech on campus with one caveat, which was at that point, the Justice Department had been criticizing predominantly liberal campuses for shutting down predominantly conservative speakers. And there are too many examples of the other direction. I said uh, to my inviters, I, I wish that the criticism would be even handed. And I, I don't know if you remember this, Phil, but in the Attorney General's opening remarks and in Rod Rosenstein's remarks and other leaders of the Justice Department, they did take pains to criticize some examples of liberty, liberal faculty members and students who had unjustifiably been censored. And one other wonderful thing about this invitation is the uh, very diverse organizations that are sponsoring it. Um, the Constitutional Studies Department, the I.N. Hersey Ali Foundation, College Democrats, College Republicans, Bridge ND, ACLU of Notre Dame Law School, and ACS of Notre Dame Law School. And I really appreciate the collaboration 
uh, among organizations that have different focuses and different ideological orientations that really epitomizes what uh, I'm aspiring to through all of my evangelizing, including through speaking and, and, and through the book. Um, so um, I wanted to, let me tell you in a nutshell why I wrote the book and what my bottom line conclusion is. I think it's quite clear why I wrote the book. I've already alluded to the two prevalent attacks on free speech on campus, but also in the rest of our society. And under the banner of attacking hate and hate speech, and I'm putting those terms in quotation marks because they have no fixed, agreed upon meaning. But when you consider how those words are used in our political discourse today, uh, both on campus and more broadly, basically people use the H word promiscuously to label and denounce and stigmatize any idea that they hate. Um, and the classic way uh, the term is used is to refer to speech that denigrates on the basis of who you are people who are uh, members of uh, religious groups or racial or ethnic groups that have traditionally been marginalized and excluded. But we also are using that term more and more to um, completely denounce and ostracize people whose ideas we disagree with. Uh, and, and so the term hate is used for policy ideas on the most important subjects uh, about race, about gender, about sexual orientation, immigration policy. And it unfortunately has led to a great chilling of discussion, especially on campus. I just read uh, a survey that was reported this morning uh, in, in, it was reported in the weekly bulletin of the Heterodox Academy, a wonderful organization I'm proud to be on um, its national advisory board, which as the name suggests, is trying to bring together people from different perspectives on campus to engage in critical thinking and dialogue to break out of their usual echo chambers and doing a lot of studies to document the extent to which this is not happening on campus. And uh, today's report uh, offered yet more evidence that there is so much self-censorship going on on campus. So even beyond the situations that uh, are well publicized where there is too much direct coercive censorship. Thou shalt not speak here, as happened at Middlebury recently, to cite the example I referred to earlier. Uh, there is a huge amount of self-censorship where uh, faculty members and students are reporting that there are entire subjects that they dare not speak about at all or dare not speak about candidly for fear of, as one of my friends put it, being called some kind of an ist or some kind of an ob. And these are, of course, the most important sensitive subjects that um, if they should be discussed at all with candor should certainly be discussed on campus. So, you know, reading all of the evidence about the breakdown in communications and, and seeing that myself, um, I decided that I had to try to do what clearly had not been done with sufficient persuasiveness uh, by myself or by anybody else earlier, which was to make the case to the predominant advocates of censoring hate speech, which uh, there's no secret that the predominant pressure now to suppress speech that is hateful on the basis of um, race, religion, gender, and so forth, that that pressure is coming predominantly from left of center. 
where I myself am situated on the ideological spectrum. Uh, although I do consider I am definitely a political independent, and I have to say that this is not, uh, the blue is not a partisan. I was trying to match your school colors. <laughs> and on the website, this is how the blue looked. Now here I see it's more of a navy blue, but look at the website and you'll see. Um, so I, I do like to consider every issue on an issue by issue basis, but Definitely, I'm, I'm on the left end of the political spectrum. However, if I'm forced to describe myself in a certain political category, I will say that I am a liberal-tarian because I care at least as passionately about individual liberty as I do about human rights and social justice and the whole left end of the political spectrum there. And the, the pitch that I make to my colleagues on that left of center um, is that for all of your passionate advocacy for values that I completely support, equality and dignity and diversity, inclusivity, societal harmony, uh, individual mental well-being. I'm completely committed to those goals. And I am absolutely convinced that the only way that we can effectively promote those goals or any other political, social, or cultural goals is through robust freedom of speech. And so that's something that I had been advocating for forever because this is a debate that's been roiling in one context or another throughout my entire adult lifetime. And part of the, um, the drumbeat for censorship, uh, which has been particularly predominant on campuses, is a notion that somehow we have to choose between liberty and equality, or sometimes it's put between civil liberties and civil rights. And I had absolutely been convinced through all of my past work and research that that could not be further from the truth, that liberty and equality are mutually reinforcing and indivisible. But again, it was clear to me that that case had not been made with sufficient uh, persuasiveness. So being an advocate and an educator, I took it upon myself to write this book. I believe, I mean, to the best of my ability, and we're all flawed, uh, I was trying to be objective and open-minded. As I told a couple of the students as we were coming in here, I had in my mind a question, which is the title of a book being written by a friend of mine who is a philosophy professor, now the president of Skidmore College, named Philip Glotzbeck. He gave me permission to quote the title of his book, and he said, of his forthcoming book, he said, you keep quoting it, now I'm really going to have to write it. Um, but here's the title. It's what would it take to change your mind? And I think that's such a great question. What would it take to change your mind? And I have to say, if I had found evidence that suppressing hate speech was necessary in order to bring about a goal of, you know, a countervailing goal of compelling importance. Some of you will recognize I'm using constitutional law language here. You know, if it was necessary to end discrimination, to foster human rights and justice, then I would say that restriction could be justified. Uh, but to the best of my examination of decades of evidence now of how hate speech laws have actually operated in other countries and how the absence of hate speech laws have operated in this country where we do allow punishment of some hateful speech but under very tight conditions, uh, I am more convinced than ever that well intended as censorship is, it is at best ineffective and at worst counterproductive. And more important than you know, my conclusions, I was really surprised to see, and my book quotes so many of them, human rights activists from countries all over the world and from 
international agencies, including uh, the United Nations, and from regional human rights agencies, including the European um, Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, uh, international human rights organizations, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, all of them are consistently speaking out against the hate speech laws in other countries, and not because of free speech uh, constraints under those countries' laws, of course, um, it is completely permissible to censor hate speech. So the resistance is coming specifically from the perspective that these laws simply are not doing the job of ending discrimination and promoting equality. I don't know uh, to what extent you follow events and other, well, of course, everybody knows about the massacre in New Zealand, which has extremely strict anti-hate speech laws, as does Australia, uh, the country from which the perpetrator came. I pay a great deal of attention to Germany because of my personal history, which I'll, I'll say a bit about in a moment. But uh, Germany, which has the strictest anti-hate speech laws in the world, with the possible exception of the Middle East, possibly some of their laws are stronger. Uh, but Germany has extremely strict laws. They're enforced extremely strictly. And yet there have just been outbreaks, uh, rampages of violence, hateful violence, discriminatory violence against Jews, against Roma, uh, refugees, immigrants. Uh, the anti-Semitic violence in Germany has gotten so bad that Chancellor Angela Merkel last year for the first time appointed a cabinet level official as the commissioner of anti-Semitism. The head of the Jewish community in Germany issued an edict a couple of years ago that observant male Jews should violate their religious belief uh, to wear the kippah, the yarmulke, uh, as a sign of respect to God. Uh, he said, it's too dangerous to do that in public. I advise you to identify yourself as a Jew. I advise you when you're going out in public, please remove the yarmulke despite the religious uh, duty. And so last, exactly a year ago, exactly one year ago, uh, an Israeli Arab, interestingly enough, was visiting a German friend of his in Berlin, you know, Berlin, a world capital, crossroads of Europe. And it was in a very trendy, hip neighborhood in Berlin. So we're not talking about some province in you know, the former East Germany where there's been a, a lot of uh, violence that's, that's gotten a lot of publicity. Um, it would be the equivalent of, I don't know, you know, a hip place like South Bend, right? Um, and um, as they're going out on the town, the German Jew who is observant removed his yarmulke, and his Israeli friend says to him, why are you doing that? And the German Jew explained this warning, this edict from the head of the Jewish community. And his Israeli friend was absolutely incredulous. He said, this cannot be. So he takes the yarmulke, puts it on his head. They go out onto the street. And of course, you can see this all on YouTube, along with everything else. They're immediately physically attacked. Uh, with virulent anti-Semitic language being hurled against them. France, which along with Germany has extremely strict anti-hate speech laws that are extremely strictly enforced, uh, anti, I mean, there's been all kinds of violence there too. And I should say against Muslims um, and, and people from North Africa, immigrants, refugees, uh, but again, anti-Semitism, because that's in my personal history, and because we're on a, in a religious campus, so I think the, the religious theme is an important one. Um, there's so much anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic violence, including murders in France, including in Paris, some of, including of a Holocaust survivor who was recently just absolutely brutally tortured and murdered, uh, that Jews are fleeing France in large numbers. And, I just got a new book, uh, which has the same uh, main title as my book, Hate 
and it's a chronicle of recent anti-Semitism in France. So it's impossible to prove, you know, a, a counterfactual. Maybe the hatred and the hateful violence would be even worse without the hate speech laws, but certainly these laws have not quelled the enormous problems. And it's so interesting that so many human rights activists in these other countries are saying that they ought to move more in the direction of our country where civil society, anti-discrimination laws, laws against discriminatory violence, uh, otherwise known as uh, laws against hate crimes or bias crimes, do exist and are enforced, not as much as they could be, but more than in other countries. And where we have such a robust um, engagement of everybody from politicians to ordinary citizens exercising the power of counter speech uh, to denounce the discriminatory messages and violence, to provide support for the people who are attacked, to educate, to persuade. So as a result of doing all the research for my book, I was convinced uh, that hate speech laws are even less effective than I had thought before I did the research. But on the positive side, and as an activist, I'm always an optimist, right? I always have to see the glass half full. Uh, on the positive side, count non-sensorial countermeasures, including counter speech, are even more powerful and effective than I had thought they would be. So my argument is based uh, not only on free speech principles, or not separately on free speech principles. My argument is based on policy concerns and strategic concerns about what is actually effective, not only for protecting individual liberty and democracy, but also for bringing about equality and dignity and all of those goals that advocates of censoring hate speech uh, think are, are, they are likely to foster. So as a law professor, I really want to say something about the First Amendment principles because to me it was thrilling to really delve into them even more deeply than I had done for all the decades of teaching in the area. I've gained increased respect. But before I do that, I said I would tell you something about my personal background because I think that that is really important. Uh, my father was born in Germany in 1922 as what later was defined by Hitler under the pernicious racist so-called Nuremberg laws. He was defined as a Jew of the second degree because his mother was of Jewish background. Uh, his father was a so-called Aryan. I deliberately say of Jewish background because her family had converted generations before, and he was raised as a Lutheran. He was a very devout Lutheran, and I was thrilled to learn that he was confirmed in a, a beautiful old church in the Dahlem section of Berlin, if any of you know it, that's near where the Free University is. He was confirmed by the famous pastor Niemöller, who was a great resistor to Nazism and wrote that famous poem about first they came for you know, everybody, and then when they came for me, there was nobody left. Uh, but under the Nuremberg laws, it was clearly a matter of racial ancestry, ethnic ancestry. So uh, my father was classified as a half Jew. And for that reason, as well as for his political opposition to Hitler, I'm very proud that as a teenager, he was, uh, even before the Nuremberg laws, he was uh, just ideologically opposed to Hitler. For those two reasons, he was sent to the Buchenwald concentration camp. Because at the time he went in, he was young enough and strong enough and healthy enough, uh, they did not immediately slate him for assassination. Uh, he was condemned to slave labor. And again, I mean, I think that's just so extraordinary. Here I am in the 21st century, the daughter of somebody who was enslaved, who was doing backbreaking, soul crushing labor in the most horrific conditions, fraught with disease. People were rampantly dying, malnutrition. 
And uh, as if that was not enough, as an undesirable, my father was slated to be sterilized. You can tell that didn't work. He was, uh, he was liberated, I kid you not, one day before he was scheduled to be sterilized. He was liberated by the US military. And I love speaking to military audiences. I, uh, uh, and I revere members of the military because I, we are all fighting for the same values, right? I know they all take an oath or an affirmation to defend our constitution against all enemies foreign or domestic, and I'm fighting in my own way for, for the Constitution. Um, so I could not loathe the Nazis more than I do. And uh, if I believed that the way to prevent the rise of Nazism in Germany or the US or anywhere else would be through censorship, I would support censorship because uh, I'm not like Patrick Henry. I don't say, give me liberty or give me death. I believe I cannot enjoy my liberty unless I'm very much alive. And uh, I'm going to tell you, the exact same point was made by a wonderful man named Ari Nair, who was the executive director of the ACLU in 1977 and 1978, uh, when we handled a very famous case, uh, took place not far from here in Skokie, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. How many of you have heard of the Skokie case? So people of a certain generation have, have heard, and, and other generations have heard of it. It really epitomizes not only the ACLU's neutral defense, even for freedom for the thought that we hate, right? Anti-civil liberties idea, but it really epitomizes what lawyers call uh, the viewpoint neutrality principle of First Amendment law. And the Supreme Court has said that is the bedrock principle, that government may never punish speech solely because of its viewpoint. No matter how hated or hateful that viewpoint is, the way we respond to it is through our own ideas, not through suppression. So when the ACLU came to the defense of a group of neo-Nazis who wanted to demonstrate in Skokie, Illinois, precisely because Skokie had a large Jewish population and also a large number of whom in those days were Holocaust survivors themselves. That's why the Nazis chose that particular forum, right? To get maximum attention, to provoke controversy. That's what the hate mongers love to do. And people play into their strategy by uh, succumbing to the desire to try to censor them. So that's what happened in Skokie. Um, it was a controversy that went on for a couple of years, was litigated all the way up to the Supreme Court. It was an easy case for us in the courts of law, right? Because it involved that crucial bedrock principle of viewpoint neutrality. But it was a very difficult case in the court of public opinion. Even, I can say, especially ACLU members, die-hard free speech absolutists, but also die-hard opponents to Nazism and racial discrimination, uh, many ACLU members said we really support free speech, but we draw the line here. And we actually lost 15% of our members. So you know, when I do hear and I read sobering statistics about people today, including people on college campuses, uh, being so eager to suppress ideas that they hate, it's worrying, but it's a chronic problem. I think it's understandable uh, in human nature. We have an instinct to, uh, if that's an evil idea, why should it be expressed? And uh, as Jeff and I exchanged in emails beforehand, he knows I'm fond of quoting the title of a book by journalist Nat Hentoff, whose title says it all. It's a book he wrote many years ago. It was called Freedom of Speech for Me, 
but not for thee, how the left and right relentlessly censor each other. Well, in the Skokie case, it was especially poignant for Arya Nair because he was himself. He was the national head of the ACLU, our national executive director, and he himself was a Holocaust survivor. Um, his immediate family managed to escape after enormous suffering and trauma, but his extended family was completely assassinated. And Ari is a wonderful defender of free speech. After he left the ACLU, he went on to become the founding executive director of Human Rights Watch and then the founding director of Open Society Foundation under George Soros, and always defending freedom for even the most obnoxious speech. So I was very surprised when I reread a wonderful book he wrote shortly after the Skokie case called Defending My Enemy that he actually said in that book, and I'm paraphrasing it, you know, I love free speech, but much as I love free speech, I loathe the Nazis even more. So if I were convinced that censoring their speech would have prevented their rise to power in Germany, I would have said, let's censor it. And he then goes on to recount history that many people don't know. I can't tell you how many people I, I talk to who just assume that the reason the Nazis rose to power was because they got away with hate speech. And that becomes an argument as to why we should censor neo-Nazi hate speech. What's not known is that in the Weimar Republic, during which Hitler rose to power, there were extremely strict anti-hate speech laws. Uh, pretty much the same law, strict laws that Germany still has, which I mentioned earlier. And not only were they strict on the books, they were strictly enforced. The leading Jewish organization at the time said the government is enforcing this law uh, fairly and thoroughly, and it's you know excellent prosecutors and, and so forth. And guess what? The Nazis loved it. These trials became propaganda platforms for them, as a result of which they got attention they otherwise would not have gotten, and sympathy they otherwise would not have gotten. It's the very same strategy that hate mongers use today, and I don't at all mean to compare them to the genocidal Nazis um, at all in terms of their ultimate plans. Uh, but in terms of strategy, it is exactly the same. So if you look at leading organizations that are crusading against uh, white supremacists and other hate groups, including the Anti-Defamation League and the Southern Poverty Law Center, the advice that they give to campuses and other communities where white nationalists and other uh, hate groups are planning on demonstrating. As they say, we know that it would feel so morally satisfying to punch a Nazi, to use one of the internet memes, or to try to cancel it, or to, dis, you know, to have disruptive protests, but you are just feeding into their tactics if you do that. Uh, please resist that temptation. Now, believe me, I completely support uh, counter speech, and that can include uh, nonviolent protests, but you have to be very strategic about what is the most effective form of counter speech in a particular situation. So let me get back to the First Amendment. Um, it's a very complex body of law. I know uh, some of the students I had the pleasure of discussing with over dinner are already quite you know, admirably well steeped in it even before going to law school, but you understand how complicated it is, and yet you can uh, quite fairly condense free speech principles, the major free speech principles, down to two major precepts. And one I've already told you about, that's the viewpoint neutrality principle. Government must remain neutral to the idea, the viewpoint, the message, the content, it's sometimes called the content neutrality principle. The corresponding second important principle is when you get beyond the content of the speech, its message, its idea, its viewpoint, and you look at the particular context, 
If speech, uh, regardless of its message, if hateful message or any other message, if in a particular context, that speech directly causes certain imminent, specific, serious harm. In other words, it causes an emergency that cannot be prevented in any way other than punishing the speech, then you can and should punish the speech. Um, and by the way, the problem in Nazi Germany was that speech that did pose an emergency, uh, the Nazis got away with, but even more importantly, they literally got away with murder, physical violence and assault against Jews and other minorities and their political opponents. Now, here in the United States, the Supreme Court has recognized several categories of speech that satisfy that emergency principle. And let me walk you through a couple of them because I think it shows that our law is so commonsensical that if people understood hate speech that can be punished and hate speech that cannot be punished, uh, they would understand that the law really does make sense. When speech poses the greatest danger, it can be punished. But when censorship poses the greatest danger, government may not censor speech. So one category of speech that satisfies the emergency principle that a lot of hateful speech uh, does satisfy, uh, we lawyers call a true threat. And I say true threat to distinguish it from the loose way we use the word threat in everyday speech. So I hear a lot of students on campus saying, I feel threatened by the fact that Charles Murray is going to be speaking on my campus or that Milo Yiannopoulos, you name it. No, that's not enough to justify censorship. That's disagreement with the viewpoint, right? Never a justification for censorship. But a true threat is when the speaker is addressing a relatively um, finite audience, right? So directly targeting uh, one individual or a relatively small group of individuals. And the speaker means to instill a reasonable fear that uh, he is going to attack or cause some harm to the audience. And notice, reasonable, it's an objective standard, not a subjective standard. So it can't be somebody who's particularly thin-skinned or uh, timid. It has to be a reasonable person. Um, and in that situation, speech can and should be punished. Now let me give you an example of speech that does satisfy that true threat standard. It comes from Charlottesville in 2017. Again, as the ACLU had done in the Skokie case, we again came to the defense of free speech rights of white supremacists, recognizing that uh, the principle at issue is one that redounds to the benefits of you know, completely the opposite ideological perspective, those who are challenging white supremacy. And one of the patterns in the enforcement of hate speech laws is that they disproportionately silence the voices of the very members of minority groups who are hoped to be protected by these laws, which is one of the reasons why human rights activists around the world oppose these laws. So in the Charlottesville case, you know, the horrific words and ideas that were being expressed, you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us. You can imagine um, how that makes me feel listening to it, but I agree that a hateful as that expression is in content, that is not a justification for censoring it. Because I know that other people consider speech that I personally uh, think is not hateful, other people consider it to be hateful. For example, um, speech by Black Lives Matter protesters uh, has often been attacked as hate speech. So I don't want to give the government that power. But when the context changed, and you had you know, masses of people who were not only chanting those words, but were bearing tiki torches that were lighted and brandishing them. 
uh, brandishing firearms, in my view, that crossed the line into uh, a true threat. And by the way, to satisfy the standard for a true threat, you do not have to actually carry out the violence. You simply have to mean to instill a reasonable fear that you're going to do so. Because if somebody has that fear, they're already suffering harm. Their freedom is already impinged upon. I, for one, would usually be out there counter-demonstrating, but I would not do that in the face of this intimidating display of lighted torches and firearms. Uh, another example where hateful speech or speech with any other content can be punished because it satisfies the emergency principle is intentional incitement of imminent violence, where the violence is likely to happen imminently. And notice that for these tests, the court is demanding a really tight and direct causal connection between the speech and the harm. In that sense, the court is departing from the standard we used to have in this country and that other countries still enforce, which was called the bad tendency test. Uh, that speech could be punished if it might indirectly at some point in the future possibly cause some harm. And just think about it. Speech, of course, always has that potential. As Oliver Wendell Holmes said in what was a dissenting opinion, subsequently adopted by the majority, every idea is an incitement. So we can't allow that potential uh, speculative possibility of causing harm to justify censoring speech. Uh, when the government did enforce that loose bad tendency test, that's when it suppressed and imprisoned civil rights demonstrators. That's why Martin Luther King wrote his historic letter from a Birmingham jail. All government protesters, all anti-war uh, protesters, anybody who was challenging the status quo could be imprisoned, and many of them were imprisoned under that loose bad tendency test. Um, I, I promised I would stop talking very soon because I want to have plenty of time to answer your questions. So in terms of uh, how I want to use my remaining time, I want to focus on the positive here because what was the most surprising to me was how powerful counter speech can be. And I shouldn't be surprised, right? And it really follows from the arguments of the, uh, those who advocate censoring hate speech. They say words are powerful. They can bring about great harm. And I do not dispute that. As the United States Supreme Court said in a recent case in which it unanimously opposed censoring hate speech, uh, yet again, that's been a recurrent holding, for many years now, uh, the court said we're protecting speech despite the fact that it is so powerful to cause harm. In fact, we're protecting speech because of that fact. The power of speech can do great good and it also can do great harm. But even more harmful is, than what speech can, can, can bring about is the harm of empowering government with a censorship tool that is inherently, unavoidably discretionary and subjective. And that's the reason why I put the term hate speech in quotation marks. I've read every single definition that has been adopted by countries around the world that has been proposed. And they are all inescapably a matter of personal predilection. One person's hateful speech is somebody else's loving speech. I mean, here on a Catholic university campus, I'm thinking of uh, the abortion debates, where um, I need, probably need not tell you that in many places, including on many campuses, pro-life expression has been attacked and, in some cases, punished and censored as hate speech, uh, allegedly hating women, right? Um, and conversely, um, those who, there are those who um, 
attack who would view from a, uh, you know, I can see a plausible argument that pro-choice expression for each group, I'm using their preferred terminology out of respect, recognizing the debates over the terminology, but that pro-choice speech could certainly be seen as hate speech if you believe, as many people do devoutly believe, that the unborn, it's an unborn child that is deserving of uh, respect and protection for its life. And so uh, to advocate abortion could well be seen as, as hate speech. And I can give you many other examples. By the way, in European and other countries that do enforce hate speech laws, uh, Christian expression, among other religious expression, has repeatedly been prosecuted and convicted as hate speech. My book gives examples for many, many different European countries, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, where even reading from the Bible, even if you are a member of the clergy, has been uh, prosecuted and convicted as hate speech and people, uh, bishops, um, priests, ministers, imams, have all been um, criminally punished. Um, uh, and again, you know, to even call it hate, I understand the impetus that certain um, views, religious beliefs are seen as being discriminatory on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, but on the other hand, to call it hate speech when people are motivated by the opposite impulse, namely love, right, to redeem people's souls. It's just one of many, many, these are just two examples I can give of um, how irreducibly subjective the concept is, which means that who is going to be punished depends entirely on the values and the judgments and the predilections of those who happen to exercise political power. And that's why all of us, especially any of us who are in a minority or likely to be in a minority in terms of political power, have the biggest stake in not giving the government that um, inevitably subjective power. Now, in my last six minutes, I promise I would say something about uh, the really positive information and inspiration I gleaned about the power of counter speech. So just as hate speech can be very powerful, we shouldn't be surprised that counter speech can be. And the main thing that I learned um, took me beyond my usual mode of thinking of expression, which is from my own perspective, what I'm doing here and what I do when I teach my classes and I do all my presentations in many different forms. I think in terms of persuasion and ideas and information and legal principles and basically advocating before a large audience. But there's another, and, and that's very important. You know, we should debate the ideas and the ideology that we think are hateful and discriminatory and stereotyped. But there's another form of counter speech that I found so compelling, and that is one on one communication with hate mongers or even leaders of hate organizations have been, and here's the term, it's interesting in a uh, religious context, they use the term redeemed, have been redeemed from the burden of their discriminatory views by the generous, patient intervention of people who will engage with them, both online and in, um, in the real world, um, the rest of the real world. And, and there are so many examples now that have been documented. Uh, the former hate mongers call themselves formers, and many of them have formed organizations, a variety of organizations that are completely committed to reaching out to others who are either attracted to are actually involved in hate organizations. A major one is in Chicago. It's called Life After Hate. Um, and there's now a whole genre, if you're interested, of you can see TED Talks uh, that come from the perspective of, of both sides, both the former hate mongers who have been redeemed and uh, people who have 
lovingly, generously reached out to them. Um, and uh, I find this so moving in the sense that it makes me realize that we can never give up on anybody. Some of the people who have been redeemed were actually leaders. Um, one of the founders of Life After Hate, a guy named Christian Picciolini, uh, was the leader of a really violent, skinhead, hateful organization. And he himself is now, he feels he could never make recompense for all the damage that he did, but he's devoting his life and uh, says that more than 100 farmers have been uh, also <clears throat> redeemed thanks to his intervention. Now, that kind of intervention is not done through criminal prosecution. It's not done through ostracizing, stigmatizing, demonizing. It is done through compassion and through empathy. A lot of these people, the, the majority of them from what I've read, uh, became attracted to these organizations not because of ideology, but because of something in their personal psyche or something in their personal circumstances, dysfunctional families, problems at school, you know, drug problems. And so they become ripe fruit for recruitment into some kind of bonding organization. And what they need is an alternative community, an alternative bond. So what the strategy that works is to, uh, to of course, you do not, for, you know, you're not empathetic to the ideas, but you don't reject them as human beings. And it's a concept of restorative justice that's becoming very prominent uh, with respect to all kinds of infractions and crimes. So it shouldn't be surprising that it seems to be, is very promising in this context as well. My last minute before my voice gives out, um, I'll appropriately use it to, to say something about uh, counter speech. I'll summarize that message. I have three epigrams in my book, all of which are about how counter speech is even more, much more effective than censorship in bringing about equality and dignity and inclusivity and all those wonderful goals. And uh, I guess my favorite of the three is Martin Luther King uh, when he said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So I want to thank all friends for not remaining silent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that really powerful and empathetic talk. Uh, as you all know, we have a, a tradition here in the program. We always invite our uh, undergraduate students uh, and our law students too to uh, ask the first question. Uh, before we do that, though, we do have a special guest. Um, great pleasure of me that to, to welcome Dean Mastillo, the Dean of uh, the College of Arts and Letters. So thank you for joining us uh, you. tonight. Any students with a question? John, go ahead, stand up and identify yourself. And the microphone is for the recording. Um, hi, my name is John Biagini, <clears throat> and uh, we actually were at the dinner, and I thought it was really um, awesome to get to talk to you about Thank that. Thank you. I felt the same oh, way John. about talking to yeah. you. <laughs> um, so at the dinner, we had also talked about the masterpiece mm -hmm. cake shop um, case that Nick actually brought mm -hmm. up. I thought mm -hmm. it was a, a good, um, kind of contentious thing to bring mm -hmm. up uh, with your you know, new book coming out. Um, so my question is, for can the, basically can the First Amendment, uh, with you know its speech rights, whether that be freedom of speech, you know freedom of uh, association, freedom of religion, um, can they be violated in favor of anti-discrimination laws? Um, so, for example, uh, if you would say yes, then would you say that? Uh, and I thought it was kind of a gay songwriter could be forced to perform work for an evangelical Christian choir looking for. Uh, basically, a tune up or to liven up uh, Leviticus 18. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure I followed the hypothetical, um, but so maybe you can try that again. But as I indicated in my opening remarks, and I kind of glossed over it, I said I was using a constitutional law term, so let me explain it. 
No freedom is absolute. Uh, and what we insist upon and what, you know, both what civil libertarians insist upon and what the Supreme Court in enforcing the Constitution insists upon is before government can restrict any fundamental right, including freedom of speech and freedom of religion, it must, uh, and here's the constitutional law lingo, it must satisfy strict scrutiny. Government has the burden of proving that the restriction is necessary to promote a countervailing goal of compelling importance. So let me use an example that's very current um, in many parts of the country, including my own home city of New York. Uh, we're having a very severe public health crisis in terms of measles. Uh, many, many afflictions, and in particular in Orthodox Jewish communities where some, certainly not all, but some influential rabbis are arguing that vaccination is inconsistent with their interpretation of religious beliefs uh, and that it is harmful. Uh, not only that it's not necessary to protect health, but it's actually harmful. Uh, and I have no problem uh, arguing, as the city has done, and as a couple of courts have done um, consistently, that the necessity of protecting against not only the children themselves of these families, but also the other children in the schools to which they go, other members of the public to which they would spread the disease, that that is a goal of, of countervailing goal of compelling importance, public health and individual health, that would justify infringing this religious belief against vaccinations. There have also been other, you know, really dramatic examples involving life and health. Now, um, one, so in addition to life and health, public safety, national security, the Supreme Court has held, and I agree, that another goal of compelling importance is another constitutional right. I would never say that the right to free speech or free exercise of religion, fundamental as they are and passionately committed to both of them as I am, that they do not outweigh the right to be free from discrimination on the basis of who you are. Uh, so I agree with the Supreme Court and other courts that have held that the right to be free from discrimination in the provision of public services when somebody is doing business in the public sphere uh, is of compelling importance. What I didn't understand from your hypothetical, John, was whether that might not be in the public sphere. You went past it a little bit too quickly. So we talked at dinner, for example, if you've got a private university, including a religious university, um, you are free to construct your own rules that are consistent with your own religious beliefs. And it would absolutely violate um, the right of a religious university, much less a church, to say that non-discrimination rules trump your beliefs about who is eligible to be a priest, for example. Can I, can I just follow mm -hmm. up on this? Uh, uh, when you have, uh, say, a First Amendment mm -hmm. freedom of religion mm -hmm. right, and uh, let's ground the non-discrimination right in the 14th mm -hmm. Amendment, mm -hmm. and uh, one provision, if you go on free speech grounds or free exercise grounds, it goes one way, but on the 14th Amendment grounds, it goes on the other mm -hmm. way. How do you navigate that case? Which amendment do you prefer? I don't think that you can prefer either one. I think you have to maximally protect uh, both of them. To, you know, and in the case of... Um, so I, I, I didn't have to face that issue when I was writing my book because I found that not only was it not necessary to suppress hate speech in order to advance equality, but actually it was necessary not to do so because um, censorship actually undermined equality. Uh, question? Uh, sure, we'll, and then we'll go here next day. Um, hi, my name is Courtney Becker. Hi. Um, so I know that recently uh, 
editors of news organizations have been pressured into apologizing and even resigning in light of publishing uh, opinion pieces that people feel uh, should not have been published. Um, the New York Review of Books editor comes to mind um, publishing a piece written by uh, a man who had been accused of sexual assault multiple times. And they, the Nation magazine is another example. Yes, another yeah. example, yeah. Um, so do you feel that, uh, you know, the question of um, free speech and then freedom of the press with uh, newspapers also having the right to choose what to publish and not, what not to publish uh, is becoming an even greater problem in this day and age of um, increased, uh, it, it, well, cries of fake news on yeah. one side yeah. and then... Um, you know, uh, in increased sensitivity to uh, things that are published um, that might be opinion pieces or, you know, the New York Times profile of a white supremacist, for example. Um, do you think that that is becoming a more urgent problem? What do you think my answer will be? It's going to be yes, Bob. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> and you want to hear why. Yes. My comment, uh, thank you, Courtney. It's a very, very serious problem. Uh, and Courtney raises, uh, it's a difficult problem for this reason, right? I'm advocating counter speech. And that is what is being engaged in by all the people who protested that the nation should not have published that poem or the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They are exercising their own free speech rights to criticize and to persuade and to pressure. But at some point, the what we call chilling effect deterring people from expressing certain viewpoints or even discussing certain topics at all becomes so enormous that it is the same practical effect as a government censor saying, thou shalt not, on pain of criminal punishment. Indeed, most of us probably care more about peer pressure and social pressure that presents even more of a realistic threat. That's why all the self-censorship on campus. It's not that students feel that they're going to be kicked out or you know punished by the authorities. They don't want to be ostracized by their by their co-students. And you know somebody somebody told me to reread John Stuart Mill's classic essay on liberty, which I do reread every few years, but it had been a few years. And I was astounded to see, Philip, are you going to remember this? That the whole essay is completely about social pressure and peer pressure. On the very first page of that famous essay, you know, great defenses of free speech. It really stands the test of time. But what I had completely forgotten is he says, I'm not talking about government censorship. I'm talking about social pressure informal pressure of p influential people in the community. A friend of mine who's the head of a wonderful organization called PEN America, it's a group of writers that also defends literature rights but also free speech. Uh, her name is Suzanne Nossel and she wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post last year and the headline was, when does counter speech become censorship? And it's a very delicate balance because we want people to feel free to robustly criticize. I mean, I want the Nazis to shut up. You know, I want people to stop having those ideas and expressing them. Um, but I'm very leery about the coercive power here. So I'm sorry I can't give you, I mean, I think those situations were appalling. I think the groveling, what I can't stand is the groveling self-flagellation. Uh, the poet in the Nation magazine, oh, how dare I even have, you know, put myself in the position of writing those lines. I can't stand that. And um, I, I'm seeing that, you know, the great uh, suppressive effect is, is really manifesting itself in kid, young adult fiction. I don't know if you followed that. They have now have something called sensitivity readers. And uh, even books that have been published that have gotten wonderful reviews and, and just seem to be, you know, on wonderful human rights themes. And then somebody will say, oh, but it didn't depict this certain person who belongs to a certain group and in a culturally appropriate way, or it was cultural. Oh, 
as a pun, cultural appropriation because you're not a member of that group. So we, we have to combat these uh, pressures. And the best thing I can think of is to say, OK, let that criticism flow. But then we have to have more robust defense on the other side. And that may take courage, right, because it's bucking a trend. And I think more of us have to have that courage to stand behind those who are accused. Do you have any other I can, I, constructive ideas? No, I just I, uh, I appreciate your thoughts on that because I, I think that yeah, I think those situations were not the best, and it's not there's no easy answer to it. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> right over here. Thank you very much for coming here and and addressing this critical issue and problem. I was born during that war when the Nazis had dominant control over most of Europe. I marched with Dr. King and Selma, and I had rocks thrown at me when I marched in southeast Chicago, about 75 miles from here. I spent time in jail, and I marched during the Vietnam War protests. I never thought at this stage of my life, <laughs> hate would become the topic of the day. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely stressful to hear in a, and I'm going to be blunt about it, in a presidential campaign, people screaming, lock her up, lock her up, lock her up, and the candidate thinking this is just fine to encourage imprisoning his opponent. I would like to hear from you, because you are also concerned about this, or you wouldn't be writing a book, your viewpoint as to why this hateful atmosphere, where people are afraid to talk to their relatives if they disagree with them, because they know they will be written off. Can you share your thoughts as to how this developed and why this has become the norm in our society now? Great question. And it was one of the questions that we uh, discussed over dinner. And I, all I can do is um, refer to other experts who are searching for causes because we cannot find solutions unless we can figure out the causes, right? Uh, and I will tell you one person in particular that I really admire a lot who's put a tremendous amount of thought into this is Jonathan Haidt. If he hasn't spoken for your program, I highly recommend him. He's a social psychologist at NYU now for many years. He taught at the University of Virginia. And he has, is an expert on moral psychology and has done a lot of examination of what it is that leads people to have such firmly held beliefs that are impervious to rational argument, why it leads to polarization and tribalism, and why has that become even worse in the recent past than it was before. And he's got a new book out that came out last year called uh, the coddling of the American mind. Um, he has a number of theories, but one of them has to do with the role of the internet and social media. As is true with all speech and all media, it has great positive potential. And think of all the wonderful movements, including for human rights, that could not have taken place without the internet, but it also has tremendous negative potential, not only in terms of being a vehicle for the dissemination of hateful views, uh, and also creating, as we all know, the famous echo chambers, which make people more and more insulated in their own views because they're only talking to people who agree with them. Uh, but studies have shown, and he cites these studies in his book, uh, that now, especially younger people, are spending a much higher percentage of their time online and a much lower percentage in actual face-to-face -face 
human contact. So there is much less opportunity to actually interact with people that are different from you, who have different backgrounds, who have different perspectives, who have different ideologies. And that's why one of the strategies that's being used by the organization he founded called the Heterodox Academy, uh, and there are other similar organizations, including Bridge USA, which I know has a chapter on this campus, something else called Open Inquiry. They're sprouting up on campuses all over the country and in communities all over the country that are using a very old-fashioned concept of getting people together to sit around a table, often breaking bread together. In my local community in, in Connecticut, that's what we call it, breaking bread, you know, and getting to know the person as a person. Surprise, surprise, it's a little bit like this. It's definitely related to the strategy I talked about uh, in dealing with hate mongers. You relate to somebody as a human being. You don't just see them as somebody who has a certain idea that you disagree with. And you know it's amazingly simple, but it's obviously becoming too rare. You know that we only come together in those rare fraught occasions, Thanksgiving, right? And and it becomes so painful because we haven't had contact in between. And and I think that again that there's so much that we can do through. Um, respectful communication and modeling. This is something else uh, many universities now are having whole departments on civic engagement and civic dialogue. Um, so um, I'm optimistic, but it's going to take a lot of work. Let's get one more question. I've been ignoring this side of the room. So. The right side, huh? from my perspective, not from yours. <laughs> Hi, my name is Patrick. Um, I'm from Virginia. Uh, and on the week of August 12th, 2017, um, I was really shocked um, to watch the news of neo-Nazis coming to my state, coming to Charlottesville. So two of my friends and I uh, went down and we joined the counter protest in Charlottesville on that day. Um, I was in the attack. Were I, you on, there on the 12th or on the 13th? On the, uh, so I was there on the 12th. So I was mm -hmm. there during the actual day of the Night the Right rally. Um, and so I was there on 4th Street. I watched the entire attack. I jumped out of the car. I watched Heather Hare's lifeless body take off the, take off the street. I agreed with the content neutrality standard. I was fully aware of it. Um, and you know, I supported the ACLU's decision to stand up and to support them in, with their legal rights. Um, but something was broken that day. I mean, that's not a system. Well, the, what I saw on the mm -hmm. streets of Charlottesville is not a system that worked. Yeah. Um, and so my question is, with the truth threat standard, the neo-Nazis of today are extremely different than the ones who marched mm -hmm. in Illinois on the basis that there's, it's not a single organization. There's always mm -hmm. been radicalized mm -hmm. elements of organizations. Mm -hmm. But when we look at how people today online become radicalized through 4chan and 8chan and mm -hmm. through different online communities, mm -hmm. when we're trying to address and, and assess the, the truth threat standard, you know, James Field, he posted a, a GIF online of a car running over people and so it's hard to know when, when there is a true threat yeah. because yeah. we can't say, you know, even if the leader is not going to, sorry, yeah. even if the leader is not going to be supporting this, we mm -hmm. don't know, you know, where the true threat is. And so I understand that we can't ban all protests mm -hmm. in spaces, but mm -hmm. specifically with armed protests mm -hmm. because, you know, I'm extremely thankful every single day that it was not, I can jump out of the way of a car, but I can't jump out of the way of a bullet, mm -hmm. but there were so many guns on the streets mm -hmm. that day. Yeah. Um, and so when we are allowing armed protests, mm -hmm. what needs to be the standard um, mm -hmm. for assessing true threat mm -hmm. uh, nowadays when we are going to allow guns to yeah. be part of these protests? What's your name, please? Patrick. Patrick, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent question. And I, I myself have been there um, several times since, very, including once very recently at, um, you know, exactly that intersection where she was um, uh, killed. Uh, so... First of all, law enforcement did have power there to uh, to get those to arrest those people once they were marching with the tiki torches and brandishing guns. There was a huge failure of law enforcement. Sadly, it was analogous. Again, I don't want to compare these neo-Nazis, contempt contemptible as they are. They weren't advocating, let alone practicing genocide. But it is a comparison to Weimar Germany, as I mentioned, in the failure to protect 
people against actual violence. Uh, you may know, Patrick, that the city council in Charlottesville appointed a bipartisan, nonpartisan commission to do a report about not only the situation in August, but there, earlier that year, there had been two other similar situations that weren't nearly as well publicized. And it was an absolutely scathing indictment of the failure of law enforcement at every level. The FBI, uh, the state police, the county police, the city police, and the campus police. The whole area where Heather Heyer and the other pedestrians were mowed down, there was not a single law enforcement official, not one. There had only been one who had been assigned, and that person had fled long ago. There was absence of training. There was absence of preparation. There was absence of communication. There was a complete failure to enforce the laws that did not allow the firearms, that did not allow the tiki torches. I've seen different explanations and theories as to why such a failure, and I have no independent knowledge, but I think it's disturbing that there are allegations that at least some of the law enforcement officials were more sympathetic than one would wish to the, to the protesters. That I don't know if that's justified or not, but whatever their motivations were, they clearly failed in the execution. And the positive aspect of that report is that it's very, very detailed and constructive about what we will do differently from now on. You know, and a lot of the police officials have been fired and there's re new staffing. Um, now, the true threat was only one example of speech that could be punished. I mean, put aside the fact that the violence itself could and should have been punished and that the true threat standard was satisfied. Uh, what you're talking about is another example that satisfies the emergency principle. When somebody is actually conspiring and providing material support for the commission of a crime, and, that, and, uh, and murder and violence, and that what is what is being alleged in a civil lawsuit that is being brought against the organizers of uh, the, the, the rally, not only, I've, keep, I've for, deliberately forgotten the name of the murderer himself, who as you know is already serving a life sentence appropriately, um, but others are, uh, the civil lawsuit was allowed to go forward. There was a motion to dismiss on a First Amendment ground, and I have read the judge's decision, and I completely agree with the judge's decision that the allegations are enough to show that there was participation and instigation and conspiracy to use the car as a lethal weapon, and that should be subject to punishment. So again, I think uh, the law is, in theory, exactly right. It just wasn't executed consistent with the theory. As I said, this was our uh, last event of the year, and uh, really just an exemplary talk and uh, wonderful questions as well. So uh, please join uh, me in thanking Professor. Well, and thank all of you for your questions.